All right, let's do a take two on this. Uh, I thought this was going to be easier without this switch included, but it turns out it's actually easier this way. So what we have here are a couple of MOSFETs. These happen to be IRF 620s, and I'll get more into that when we got talk about the actual simulation. But hopefully you can see that there. And the green wire is the uh, gates touching, clamped together. The yellow wire is the sources. And the drains are just kind of bent upwards and just kind of hanging there. Over here we have a 9 volt battery and a 10k resistor and you can see that the wires attach to the gate and the source of the MOSFET. And the idea here is that when I touch that switch and push that momentary switch together, it's actually going to apply the 9 volts to that 10k resistance, charge up the gates of the MOSFETs, and they will conduct. And my meter, which is set to, you know, beep when, uh, when these two things touch, will go beep. So let's go ahead and do this. It's going to be a little bit interesting because I'm trying to do this one-handed. Apologize for the ghetto nature of this setup. Uh, I would really like this to be a lot safer. Can't recommend anyone else do things this way. My last most recent move was forced on me very, very suddenly because of COVID bullshit. And so this is the best that I can do at the moment. But let's not claim that this is safe. I don't claim that this is safe. And I don't think anyone with a brain would claim this setup is safe. So there you go. I've got my two probes hanging on those drain pins of those MOSFETs. And there's the meter. I'll try and hold this back far enough. The camera unfortunately zooms in a little bit. I've tried to de-zoom it, but I'm actually having to stand almost a full arm length back here. So when I hold this button down, the nine volts should energize this 10K resistor, charge up the gates. Those should start conducting and we should hear a beep. So I'm gonna make that a little bit more visible to you guys. Okay. And you may ask, well, is it polarity sensitive? Like maybe are you just going through the body diode of one of the MOSFETs? So let's change polarity. Right now, the black one is on top and the red one's on the bottom. So let's switch it up. Yeah. Depth perception is hard, apparently. Okay, so now we've got the red one on top and the black one on bottom. You can see the meter's not beeping. There's no conductivity. And let me push the button again. I wish that button was a little less stiff. That's what I said about your mom last night too. Okay, so there is the DC case where we can see that the meter, the DC will flow both ways. And then I will set up and do the AC case in just a sec. Uh, shouldn't take long for you guys. Might take me a couple minutes, but isn't that great? That's the power of editing. So how do we transition this setup from DC to AC? Well, we're going to need a couple things. One thing that would be nice would be an AC load. In this case, we have a nightlight. And the other thing we're going to need is something that's known in the vernacular as a suicide cord. The kind of cord that you want to use if you want to kill yourself. Now this one arguably is, I don't want to say safer because there's nothing safe about a suicide cord. This one is arguably a tiny bit less dangerous because as you can see, it actually says fuse 2.5 amps max in there. So if you do try and run more than 2.5 amps continuously through this thing, it's probably going to pop the fuse and maybe you'll be dead when the fuse pops or maybe not. We'll see. In any event, let me actually hook this up to the nightlight, and then I can actually demonstrate by turning on and off the power strip how this actually turns on and off the thing hooked up to the suicide cord. I'll be right back. Okay, so I've got the nightlight hooked up via these clip leads, and let me just stick that under there, take a good look at those, make sure they're not touching, that looks good. Let's hope there are no sparks and that quilt doesn't catch on fire. Would be funny if I burned down my house on live YouTube video, don't you think? And, uh... <laughs> really, really hate the uh, inherent zoom of this thing because I'm honestly not sure I can actually get my hand all the way down here, but you can see that there's the, the switch and we'll turn that on. And now you can see that the light is on. And let's see if I can reach this. It's actually really tough. Okay, so I think you get the idea, right? The electricity is, AC is coming down the suicide cord and it's going to the nightlight. 
And now we're going to try and hook things up so that the MOSFET switch, solid state relay, is interposed between the suicide cord and our load, which is the nightlight. Again, I will be right back. I don't want to try and wire all this shit one-handed, especially when 120 volts AC is involved. I'm already risking killing myself. So hopefully what's going on here is obvious. I've taken the hot line from the suicide cord and it goes up and it goes to one of the drains on the MOSFETs. And then this red cord goes to the other drain, comes back down here and plugs into the nightlight where the black wire used to plug in. So we can turn this on again, if I can fucking reach. So what's going to happen here is absolutely nothing. And the reason is that I'm not pressing the red button and therefore the MOSFETs aren't turned on. And these are IRF 620s. They have a 200 volt withstand. And so the 120 volts AC from the line is not going to go through the MOSFETs and nothing's going to happen. The solid state relay is turned off. Okay. Now, here's the money shot, the one you've been waiting for. When I press the red button, we're going to assert nine volts on the gates of those MOSFETs. I had to make sure that black wire was still plugged in. I couldn't see through the camera viewfinder. When I hold down the red button, the MOSFET gates are going to turn on and current is going to flow through the solid state relay, AC current, and it's going to light up the nightlight. Okay. I can do this. There you go. I'm pinching the switch closed. The nightlight is on. I let go. It's off. Pinch it closed. It's on. Let go. It's off. Okay. So that's your 120 volts AC going through the solid state relay and the solid state relay turning it on and off. And I know this is a very small load. I actually measured it with my kilowatt and it's only 300 milliamps. So it's only about four Watts maybe. Uh, but I just wanted to demonstrate that this actually does work with real parts. It's not something that only happens in simulation. And I wanted you guys to be able to see maybe what might be the simplest way to hook this up. Um, that said, I do want to disclaim right here. If you do use a suicide cord, you're probably going to kill yourself. So if you don't want to kill yourself, then you probably don't want to ghetto rig this like I did. Again, I want to disclaim, I have had to move very recently because of COVID bullshit. I had to pick up my workbench and pack everything very quickly. If I could even find my static mat, I would have put my blue anti-static mat on here, but I couldn't even find it. So I'm using this HDPE uh, tool case, which, you know, 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 16 ohms per centimeter, which is maybe a little bit much. It might build up some static and zap the MOSFET gates. But again, don't try this at home. I just wanted to show you with actual parts that this does actually work in practice. And, um, you know, things might be different with a, a non-resistive load with an inductive or capacitive load. Perhaps some little shit could happen. And now let's go to the simulation so you can actually see how the IRF 620s behave in simulation. All right. Now let's do, do one more time here just so you can see that this didn't just work once. I'm having to do all this at arm's length because my stupid camera loves to zoom way in. I need a better camera than the stupid cell phone camera. Okay. Clear. You understand now? All right, good. Let's go to simulation and I'll show you the fun new simulation toys I got before I tested these IRF 620s in real life. Well, that was a pain in the ass. And now my voice sounds like trash because I wasn't able to unpack my good mic, so I'm using a shitty headset mic. Ugh, anyway, let's take a look at the simulation. As you can see, this is pretty much the same schematic that we had before, but I've done a couple things. The first thing is I've added a couple grounds. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to be able to use the traditional or normal solver on this and not have to use the alternate solver. Putting these grounds in these places makes it so that the traditional solver will work, which is great. But it also means that some of these nodes that I intend to be floating don't really float so much anymore because now they have a ground attached to them. 
whatever, I think for the purposes of this demonstration, no big deal. So if you're wondering what we just tested, basically what we just tested was this part of the circuit only, with this whole other part of the circuit being simulated more or less by a 9-volt battery. I didn't disclaim this, but I suspect strongly that uh, the 9-volt battery would float along with the voltage on the AC source, so that was why I rigged up that push button and didn't touch the battery directly. I feared that the battery might be energized with the full line voltage and I could even more easily kill myself than I was already uh, ready to kill myself. So, yeah. So you can see that really the only big difference besides adding grounds is that there are now IRF 620s down here for the MOSFETs. You may also notice this include IRF 620.lib. I actually found a uh, sub-circuit definition for the IRF 620s that simulates a whole bunch of the parasitic capacitances and such, and I'll put a link for where I found this down in the description. Basically, uh, the only trick you really need to know is you need to include your irf620.lib file with the spice include directive, and then you also need to control right-click on your MOSFET, and in this prefix, this was uh, nm, which I assume means nMOSFET, but when you're using what I assume is an external library, you need to change that to x. If you don't do that, then Spice will just blow up. Make sure you control right click after you put down the MOSFET and change the prefix to X. And there is a uh, not a very good page, in my opinion, on the LT Spice wiki. I'll also link that in the description that talks about using these external transistor models. Let's actually simulate this, but first I want to show you that we're using the regular solver. You can see the solver is the normal solver right here. And let's run it. Oop, hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of wanted this little circuit on the bottom. <laughs> okay, let's just look at, well, why not look at all the other stuff? Here's your unregulated voltage. You can see it kind of spikes up and down. And then let's look at our regulated, well, you're not going to be able to see the regulated voltage, so let's look at um, the uh, 120 AC source voltage in blue because you can't really see blue on the recording very well. And then we can look at the regulated voltage in red, which should show up on the recording pretty well. Let's go ahead and zoom in here. 9 volts versus 120 volts, the scale's a little different. So there you go. And then let's nuke those and run it, and we'll run it again. Fix my windows for me, that's very nice. Let's go ahead and look at the V on, V off in green. And we'll look at the gate voltage in blue. You guys will probably have a hard time seeing this in blue, so yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. So you can see that they're just one is just the reverse of the other, that when V on, V off goes low, the gate voltage goes high. And then um, in red, let's actually show the current going through R5, this 120 ohm resistor right here. So you can see that when it's on, current flows through the resistor. And when it's off, including a, kind of a hard snap off right here, you know, that snaps off pretty quick. Um, so the other thing that's worth looking at, let's go ahead and nuke this guy and this guy. And let's examine V gates more closely in red. V gates in red. So I think you can see here that there are some weird spiky stuff on the V gate voltage. And it may be hard to see, but maybe you can tell if I zoom in on this. Nah, you can't tell. It's easier to see here. You see that there's like little, little uh, currents. These are just those microamp leakage currents. And the, the little spiky stuff on the gate voltage actually corresponds to those. What's happening here is that my better transistor model for the IRF620s is actually modeling the drain to gate and gate to source capacitances. And so that's what these little weird glitches are, is there's a capacitor, a parasitic capacitor, between the drain and the gate of the MOSFET, and so a little bit of current manages to get squirted through when the voltage source that you're switching on and off, the line voltage, makes a peak, essentially. But the important thing to know is what the size of these little transients is. And if I start at like zero millivolts here and get my cursor at like zero millivolts, we can see, if you look down in the lower left, you can see that dy is 61.3 millivolts. Maybe if I get a little more precise, 59.8 millivolts. There's only a 60 millivolt glitch on that V gate line. 
and that is way less than the three volt minimum, whoops, the three volt minimum that you actually need to turn those MOSFETs on. Maybe if there's some parasitic capacitance in other parts of the system, or if other parts of the system aren't fully floating, there's a lot of other things that can go wrong here, especially if you, you know, use some modification of this circuit. And, and then also, let's, let's look at this other glitch back here down near the start time. Okay, so here's another glitch, a much bigger glitch. However, take a look down in the lower left at the DY of only 728 millivolts. So that's still way less than the 3 volts that we need to turn the MOSFETs on. So there are these little glitchy things caused by parasitic capacitances in the IRF620 and in any MOSFET. All MOSFETs have some amount of parasitic capacitances in them. It's inherent to the way that they're made. But there's not nearly enough current coming through those parasitic capacitances to actuate the MOSFET to turn it on and cause bad things to happen, at least not in this circuit with this 10k resistor and the way everything else is set up here. Now if you change something, if you use a gate driver, if you don't opto-isolate your control signal, there's all sorts of ways this can be screwed up. But just wanted to show you guys uh, how you could simulate actual IRF 620s, just as I used on the bench. How do I zoom everything? There we go. So yep, it does actually work with real IRF 620s. And uh, last disclaimer before we go here, I did not use IRF 620s because IRF 620s are the best MOSFET for this circuit. They were just the cheapest and easiest ones that I could get at an electronic store that was actually open during all this COVID shit going on. And because they had a 200 volt drain to source withstand, they were more than good enough to demonstrate the concept. They only have a 3 volt, 3 volt, 3 amp maximum current. So you wouldn't want to use these if you were really switching something big. And a 200 volt drain to source withstand might not be enough if you were switching an inductive or a capacitive load, you know? So obviously I wouldn't use IRF 620s if I was really building this for real, but it does demonstrate the concept. It does show that the circuit works. And I just wanted to show those things to you. I hope that you have enjoyed this. I hope you learned something and I hope that you're staying healthy. See if I can unzoom a little bit here. No, no unzooming. Stuck with this close in view. Well, that sucks. So, what we have here is a very simple MOSFET test rig. The green wire is connected to the gates of both MOSFETs. The yellow wire is connected to the sources. There's a 10K resistor. I think you can see the color code there. And just to give you a little bit of a close up of what that looks like. So the gates are tied together, the sources are tied together, and the drains are pulled out and floating freely. And the theory here is that when you take this positive wire from the 9 volt battery and you touch it to the other side of that 10k resistor, which normally pulls the gates and the drains together, then they will conduct. So let's go ahead and do it. This is going to be very, very interesting. Forgive me for this ghetto setup. My most recent move happened on very, very short notice, and I have not had time to unpack my workbench properly. And if the safety Nazis are flipping out about the safety of this right here, just wait till we get to the next part of the video. Oh, I shouldn't have done that yet. So um, the meter is set on conductance mode. So when the two probes touch, it's unlatched. So you really have to push them together tight. There you go. You can see when I push them together, Sorry, I'm having to do all this one-handed. It's tough to hold the camera and also do the experiment at the same time. But I think you get the idea. When there's conductivity between the probes, it goes beep. When there's... There we go. Frame that. There you go. So you can see my titanium Leatherman here. When I put both on it, and when I take them off, it doesn't conduct. Okay? So... Let's go ahead and hang the probes off the drains of the FETs. Yeah. Let's try and get it so you can actually see me doing it, which is hard because <laughs> depth perception looking through a, a 2D camera is a bitch. Okay. So I hope you can see that. 
I hope you can see that I've got the probes hung off the drains and that it's not touching anything else. Okay. So this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be fun trying to do this with one hand. Maybe I should get someone else to be a cameraman for me here. So there's our 10K resistor. So you guys can even see that. And uh, then the hot wire, the, the 9 volt battery hot wire is going to the gates that will pull the gates up because of the voltage drop caused by the current going through that 10K resistor. And so the idea here is when I touch that red wire to this part of the resistor, it turns the MOSFETs on, the drains conduct, and it goes beep. <sighs> Fucking, I really, really, really hate this fucking ghetto rig setup. God damn it. That is so fucking annoying, I can't even tell you. Can you guys see this? Alright, so... I touch it. It conducts. Lift it off, it stops. Touch it, it conducts. Lift it off, it stops. Hopefully, that's a good enough demonstration of that part of the circuit. I will come back and actually show you switching AC in just a second.